Welcome, everyone. I'm David Nuremberg, the Leon Levy Professor and Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and I want to welcome you to the first of a series, uh, inshallah, of conversations about the place and practice of the arts and sciences in the past, present, and future of humanity. Now, that's a big topic. <laughs> and the reason it's so big is it allows us to invite anyone who has made a foundational contribution to anything we care about here at the Institute for Advanced Studies. So it's my great joy that our first interlocutor is one of the great vocal artists of our age, the mezzo-soprano Joyce Di Donato. So since her 2005 debut at the Met as Querubino in Notre de Figaro, what a great role for a debut. Um, I think that Joyce has been known to every great opera house in the world. You can read more about her storied career in the program. I won't rehearse it here because I really want to give time to her voice, spoken voice. Um, and I won't talk to you about her discography. Discography is an odd word because graphy and disc don't seem to me to go together. So I'm gonna say her recordings. Um, which are equally acclaimed. I'll mention that she's been nominated for and won multiple Grammy Awards, as well as the Olivier Award for Outstanding Achievement in Opera and the Met's Beverly Sills Award, Beverly Sills Artist Award. To the miracle of her voice, she adds a fantastic ability to inhabit the characters she plays with a psychological sympathy and a dramatic expressiveness that is, I would, it, it's almost frightening, as anyone who watched The Hours will attest. Um, in, in, the, in, in the scene with the Rose, for example, there was more compressed psychological passion than in all of Medea, <laughs> so, um, which is another great opera, but, but much more dramatic in its, in its, in its psychological swings. So um, one learns watching her about the art also about oneself and about the possibilities of the human. And of course, if you've seen her in a really intimate setting, as Shirley and I saw her last night at Eden, how many people were here at Eden? I'm very sorry for those of you who weren't. <laughs> you know that that expressiveness and psychological intensity is present uh, at the micro as well as at the macro scale, from five feet away as well as across the entire house of the Met, not to mention the tractor beam of her charisma. Um, Eden represents yet another side of her artistic persona. It's at once an album, a tour across how many continents? Five? <laughs> a program of pedagogy, an effort at healing, and an attempt to intervene in the Anthropocene, in, in, in a, the current climate crisis. I've not even begun to talk about her many other projects, from prison education and singing at Sing Sing to children's choirs. But you're not here to hear from me, so please welcome Joyce Di Donato to the stage. I need a drink after that intro. <laughs> it's not vodka. I, no, it's, it's better. No, thank you, that's very kind. So welcome to the Institute. We are thrilled to have you here, not only because many of us are Di Donato junkies, I think <laughs> fan is too soft a word, but because it feels as we have a great deal to learn from analogies between our forms of life here at this place, which is dedicated in the words of Abraham Flexner, our founder, to carrying on the work of foundational thought and discovery, and the work you do in opera as an artist, an interpreter, a creator, and a teacher. So maybe we start with Eden. Um, it's terrific to finally hear it live last night, thanks to Princeton University Concerts and its director, Marna Seltzer. Um, it's, this isn't the first major project in which you bring your voice and the musical traditions you work in to bear on pressing issues of the age. So I'm thinking also of your 2016 War and Peace, uh, Harmony Through Music. Uh, so these are projects that seek to change the world. So my first question really is, um, I would just ask to, how you see the relationship between your art form and activism. 
uh, and changing in the world. So given that the musical canon of opera and bel canto, which are your specialties, is so deeply framed by the 17th to the 19th centuries, how do you feed them with the blood of the present? How do you make them speak to the needs of the future? Ah, uh, it's a um, big introduction and a big first question. Um, this is I, the institute. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Am I sweating yet? Okay. Um, it's, you know, I will, I will tie it very concretely to the, the foundation of this, of carrying on the work. I think when these pieces were written, I'm not convinced that Handel understood that he was mastering the psyche of the human condition. Mozart was writing these, it, it was just moving through them. It's such huge volume. And they were allowing the inspiration of mastery, of musical mastery, harmonic mastery, psychological mastery of the human condition to come through them on the music. And the uncomfortable place I've always felt with opera and classical music is I'm sitting here singing these things about a woman not feeling beautiful because she's too old or the comfort of a tree. But I have a story from Sing Sing about that that I could share as well. I'm going to share it right now. And I'll, don't let me digress too far. I was in Sing Sing. I brought a mini Eden to them in December. It's a part of a uh, Carnegie Hall concert where they've been going for about 15 years where the men learn instruments and they also learn composition. So I brought a little mini Eden to them. I've been going for a number of years now, but I'd missed them for about three years during COVID. And I, now I'm hitting myself about the way I introduced it, but I said, I'm gonna sing a song now that's really a pretty stupid song but for you men who are learning composition, I want you to pay attention how you take a kind of silly lyric and make something really beautiful out of it. This is a song about a tree. And okay, the tree is really beautiful and I have a lot of shade under the tree. It's not very sophisticated, but listen to what happens. And I sang Ombra Mai Fu with piano. And they applauded and somebody raised his hand. His name was Lingo in the front row, short short guy, and he goes, Miss, Miss Joyce, I don't mean any disrespect, but I don't think that song's stupid. <laughs> I'd do anything to sit under a tree like that right now. <laughs> and that summarizes, and I have a lot of stories from that place, that summarizes what drives me crazy about my industry and the classical music industry is that we put these things on a top shelf with white gloves and we say, this is what this is. And you must be reverent and you must sing it this way and this is the way it goes and this is the way we want to hear it. And I just think, have you listened to it? Have you looked at the poetry? It's like cor blood coursing through your veins. It's alive. And all of these things, are applicable to our life. You know, we're lucky with the hours that it was written today, but you know, we're looking at a, a woman's life in Virginia Woolf. She lived a hundred years ago and shining a light on it through art. Same as can be said of Medea, I mean, written quite a lot long, much longer ago. But my whole frustration and passion and joy about doing these kinds of projects is putting it out into a world where we no longer can take music education and cultural education as for granted the way we could have decades ago. But today that's not for granted that a young audience is gonna come and they have a context for Handel or Mozart or Mahler. So I wanna just shake off the cobwebs and say, listen to this, they're talking to us. If we had listened to the warning from Mislevichek 300 years ago about the plagues that were arriving and the seashores that were being destroyed, maybe we could have learned something. So let's listen now. And I, I want to shake up the audience and say, you're not, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get today. So don't be complacent in how you come to listen. 
listen with ears that are on edge. And I want to present it in a way that somebody who's 16 and has only been looking at this their whole life can look up and go, oh, what's the, wow, what's that? That's not what I thought it looked like. That's not what I thought it was supposed to be. Because I don't think it's a moment to participate and sit and listen in a way where we think we already know what we're going to hear. And I want to challenge the people that come and say, this is a moment, well, every moment has been that way, but it's 2023, I'm particularly awake about it, is this idea of don't just feel good in the concert hall. Figure out what you have to do to take it home with you and let this harmony balance out your life a bit. Let the inspiration of, of altruism and compassion and empathy permeate your life more deeply. It's lovely, and I'm not taking away when we have a great concert experience, and that sometimes is enough, and I'm okay with that. I've done that, but I also am ready to, like, you know, push the envelope a little bit. Also, at the end of the day, I have a blast doing it. It's a ton of work. It's crazy. It's breaking a lot of boundaries or expected walls, but I, I have fun with it. <laughs> and your first role at the Met, Figaro, that was a political opera when it was made. It's not as if opera was ever yeah. not. The question is how to make those forms still speak so powerfully as you, as you make them speak. Yeah. Uh, the key is, for me, you go to people that you want to share it with and you say, listen to this. When I go to Sing Sing, the first time I went, they said, an opera singer coming, okay, well, tell her to bring opera. And I, my first instinct was maybe I should bring Somewhere Over the Rainbow or something pretty that they might know. And they said, no, we want to hear opera. And so I brought a seven-minute Handel opera, Piangero. And I brought Tanti Affetti, an eight-minute opera, or Aria. And I said, have any of you guys heard da 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 bum bum And they all go, but it up, but it up, but it up, but it up. They knew, and I said, this was written by that guy, the guy who wrote that. And they go, okay, yeah, that's right. I know, I know opera. <laughs> and, and so there's, a, there's a, a doorway that opens. I was literally two hours ago in a daycare with a friend of mine visiting her child, and there were seven kids, and it was kind of chaotic. And who are you? I'm a singer. Oh, and they kind of went like that. <laughs> and I started, there was a kid there whose mother plays video, opera videos for him. And I said, do you like to sing? He goes, no. Do you like to dance? No. I said, you could be a conductor. He goes, I could be like James Levine. <laughs> and I said, I met James Levine. And I sang this with him. And I started humming Bel Raggio. And those seven kids went, Phew. I mean, I didn't sing it a full voice. It was a small room. <laughs> but they just, so I've, done, I've seen it in refugee camps. I've seen it in prisons. I've seen it. It's the same music, but it's music that is sung with going, listen to this. And not like, listen to this. I have prepared it correctly. And no, no, I don't care about that. I don't care if it's correct. It is what they have given us is a roadmap to how to better humanity. Mm. And of that, I have seen it, and I'm convinced of it. And that's where I want to put my energy. One of the ways you use that energy is in collaboration. Um, and I, Eden has many pieces that are from Handel to Ives, yeah. but you also have an original piece, uh, the, the First Morning of the World, which was composed by British composer Rachel Portman and the American poet Jean Shear, who yeah. has written for you before, I think, other song cycles. Um, Dario, do you mind putting up that, that clip? We follow the unanswered question with a world premiere by the extraordinary composer, Rachel Portman, with text by my good friend, Jean Shear. Collaborators establish the path that your voice is going to follow. 
they establish the ideas and sentiments that your instrument, which is all of you, expresses, and the technical challenges you face as you follow that path. So it's a very intimate collaboration, every bit as intimate as our mathematicians and historians and social scientists, et cetera. Um, so how do you decide who do you want to collaborate with, and what does that collaboration look like? Huh, it, well, it looks different with different people. Um, Jean, for example, I said, Jean, we're doing this program called Eden. And at that point, I knew we had the unanswered question and we had Ich bin der Welt abandon gekommen. So we had the opening number and we had the closing number. And I knew Ombra Mai Fu would fit in there somewhere. But the rest was up for grabs. But I said, because this is about creation, we have to have a world premiere on it. We have to create something for this project, which is a bit unusual because the orchestra, Il Pomodoro, that we do this with, mm -hmm. is an original instrument orchestra. They normally only do Baroque music. Um, luckily, they have a visionary leader and conductor, and he was like, I don't want to just do Baroque. And then he gave this idea of doing Charles Ives, and I went, whoa, whoa, whoa wait. <laughs> That's pretty far away from Baroque, but we're, we're doing it because we want to. Um, and I said, Jean, I'm not sure what this looks like yet, but I do know that I want to take people on a journey and I want them through the questioning that Ives sets up in the unanswered question, which could be anything. I want them and I want us to go so that when they leave, there's a deeper connection to the world as they are in it right now and that they leave with a bit of hope. That's really what I, my end goal with this was to give some hope because I think with hope people will activate a bit more. And so I said, write about Eden, which could have gone in a million different directions. And um, I left it to him to, in terms of collaboration. I said, this is what I want people to feel by the end of the show and go to it. And he took months, which made me a little bit nervous. And then I got an email and he said, I think I got it. Now, I've worked with him enough to be able to trust him and he spent a lot of time trying to understand what we wanted out of this. But the subject line was the first morning of the world. And I got goosebumps. And I read it and he had very smartly avoided anything biblical there's nothing in that piece that would put it into any kind of creation story mm -hmm. in any degree. It's simply that I wonder if the song that the birds sang on that first morning of the world has changed. <laughs> so it's about prompting and questioning and, and, you know, there is a language in the rings of trees and there's a language in the river and I, I think I used to speak it, or it, it's familiar and I, I want to know more about it. And so he, for me, I didn't change a word of what he did and we sent it to Rachel and Rachel also got chills and she worked on the music. And then with her, because we had never worked together, it went in a very different direction than I expected because the poetry of Jean's was so evocative and I was hearing all kinds of orchestrations and swells and big things. And she went in a different direction and she went very quite intimate and quite internal. And I asked her about a few of the questions and, and she explained where she was coming from and I thought, oh, oh your idea is much better than mine. <laughs> uh, because my idea was much more concrete and demonstrative and it would have sort of pushed an enforced kind of imagery into people's mind. And instead what she did was create a tapestry where people could dream and, mm -hmm. and help create their own thing. So what we wanted to do with Eden overall, with the set, et cetera, is, is to create an atmosphere where every listener has to enter and participate in creating what Eden is on any given night. And it works because in every venue we've been, it's been a very different experience. So in a way, I mean, it's great working with Jean and Rachel, 
but probably the most important collaborator of the night is the audience and the kind of energy and the way they listen. I mean, Pomodoro is a great collaborator. They're amazing. Uh, well, this brings me to the hours. Uh, I mean, in which you ravaged the, Metro the Metropolitan Opera in, in, in your role as Virginia Woolf. So I just say that in case, for those of you who, very, very few of you who don't know. Um, you are famous for your ability to represent characters who are really torn by passion. I think of Purcell's Dido or Berlioz's Didon, uh, which you just did last year, and it's, it's, it's hard, it's... Oh. <laughs> um, were there particular, ch you, you, you splendidly, I, I thought, um, presented for us the moods and the mental fragility of the writer, both through the timbres of your voice, but also through the inflections of your, through the dramatic expression. Were there any challenges that were particular to this role uh, that were different from the ones you've encountered with these uh, large? I think maybe the one thing I had to really consciously put to the side was Virginia Woolf, <laughs> oddly enough, because she was, she's a revered figure. Um, people have a lot of opinions about her. There's a sense of almost ownership to her and what she represents for a lot of people. And um, I was keenly aware of that. There also, I mean, then you have you know, Nicole Kidman in the film, which is a big reference point as well. And the first question people would ask me is, are you going to do the nose? And I was like, <laughs> that's the least interesting question about preparing a world premiere of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> and so I consciously and purposefully uh, only went to the score. There, there's two things that I really dove in. I mean, I, I was familiar with her writing, but I'm maybe a little bit method this way that I thought, I'm not going to go read Mrs. Dalloway now because in that piece, she doesn't know what it is yet. She hasn't found the first sentence. So there was that. There was on YouTube, there's one video of her speaking voice. It's about 14 minutes long. And I listened to about a minute 20 of it, and I had to turn it off. Is this really, oh, oh, it is very opposite of what the way the role is written. And it was super, uh, I don't know, I can't do the right, listen to it, you'll understand. Um, but just pinched, and th I thought, nope, that's not Virginia of the hours. But there was, there's a shattering video that's, it's an okay biography. It's about 45 minutes, but at the very end, Angelica shows up as an adult. Angelica was her niece, and she's part of that scene with the flower. And it is the most, one of the most haunting things I've ever seen, because first of all, she appears on camera and she looks like Virginia, and she's completely broken, at least in this video, and she says, oh yes, my aunt was very, uh, very demanding. She really wanted us to tell her how, how much we loved her and she would almost force us to tell her and she was very demanding that way and, and, and there was a lot of pressure to be on her and then uh, I didn't know she was sick again before she went into the river. I didn't know but uh, three days before that she came and she was particularly cold that day and she was demanding me to tell her that I love her and I couldn't, I, could, I just couldn't and, and, and then I never saw her again. And it's the most, it's just shattering because you also see the shadow of Virginia in there. And so I took a few things there and then I went to the text by Greg, which was just, I think, brilliant in how streamlined and concise it was. And the music that Kevin wrote, in particular for Virginia, just, um, it ached. And it also soared. It's, I think, what I missed in the movie a little bit is that the genius of her and her passion and her um, insistence on it being correct. And for me, everything was there in the score. And because I think I didn't try to embody her, mm -hmm. I was free to put the, that essence of her out there. And I loved singing it. I couldn't be further away from her, but I loved no, singing you, her. No, you, you call yourself a belligerent optimist yeah. and here playing Virginia Woolf. Um, 
the hours, Dead Man Walking, Eden, and other projects in which you've collaborated are all good examples of how opera today is working to establish a dynamism in a, at a moment in which opera and many other cultural institutions are critiqued as elitist, conservative, out of touch, et cetera. Um, expensive, <laughs> archaic. And it's not just opera, it's also symphonies, museums of fine arts, universities, not yet institutes for advanced studies. But, um, so there's another analogy between our forms of life. Uh, how should opera and other cultural institutions uh, respond to that critique? And if I could ask you to prophecy, uh, where do you see opera in 20 years if we get it right? and if we get it wrong? I don't like that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it makes me nervous. It's a good question, and it's a, it's a, it's a good question to be asking. I, I never like to predict the future because I usually undershoot it. If some people, I sometimes get asked, where do you see yourself in 10 years or five years, and I have never answered that question. I, um, I like to stay where I am and do the work now. And where it brings me, it brings me. And I think, well, I mean, of course, opera and classical music has been professed to be dead for centuries. And, you know, they, Mozart on down the line has been scraping together for pennies to get their art heard, and the intendants never understand. And it's a sort of old story. But, you know, I think what is happening right now in America, we've never had so many new pieces um, being written. And pieces that are opening up to a lot of different stories. That was one of the powerful things of the hours, was seeing genuine mental illness, mental health, in a modern way being portrayed on the screen. And not in over the top, she's sleepwalking and she's going mad in a theatrical way, but in a way that people looked at the screen and said, that was my mom or that's me. And I think that's very powerful. I think we're seeing a shift from the Met saying these pieces are resonating because they're our stories. And I think it's wonderful that the industry is embracing mm -hmm. that. The beautiful thing, and this is what I find with Eden as well, is you, you put a new story against Traviata, and you see Traviata in a different way. And Traviata then, I don't know, you can find, in my experience, I can meet it in a more profound way. Because I also am seeing stories that, that, that feel like they're our fingerprint. Because also, we need to do it as audiences and as creators. We need to be doing the hard work of looking in the mirror as a society. That's what Figaro did. Mm -hmm. It held up a mirror and go, look at yourselves. And if we don't do that as artists, we're missing out on something, I think, very crucial. And it becomes theater. It becomes cosmetic. It doesn't become that kind of... Um, the societal level of work that we need to do as artists. My last question, uh, as a bridge to, uh, to the, collaborat the, collabor the collaboration is about to happen, is about, um, I won't call it teaching, but our dedication, which is mutual, this institution, your institutions, to uh, helping the next generation actualize its own potential, its own talent. Um, so there's a story, I don't know if it's true, that at a master class in London in 1998, a distinguished figure in opera said to you um, that you didn't have anything original to contribute to the art form. Uh, one of the things I always feel when I watch your master classes, the, the, the Carnegie Hall uh, master classes, is that whenever you uh, listen to a young singer, you're never asking, is this person, does this person have something to contribute to the art form? Is this person going to be great? Is this person, you're always asking, what is the intervention I can make at this moment for this person that will help them actualize their talent? It might be the legato, it might be foreign language accents, it might be dramatic expression, but it's, it's just the intervention you feel you can help with not a global judgment. And so I feel mm -hmm. like I learn from watching you teach. And I guess my question before we move on to the master class is, can you tell us a little more 
uh, we're all teachers here, about how you see your role as a teacher. Um, I, had, I did have a few bad experiences, so I had a couple experiences where I thought, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think you also know that when, when you're open as a teacher, the best teacher-student moments, you usually feel like you come away having learned the most. Mm -hmm. So I think staying very open is really important. I never know what I'm going to find when I work with a singer. I really never know. And so I'm nervous. What am I going to say? Am I going to have anything to say? Is there any work to do? It's art, so of course there's always things to find. My goal in general is to help unlock within them what they already know, especially with singers. I mean, it is such a naked thing to do because our expectation from the audience is perfection. I mean, I'm a baseball fan and if you hit 350, yeah. you're in the Hall of Fame. If you hit the ball <laughs> one out of three times. And I'm like, well, that's not right. <laughs> Ours is perfection, of course, which we will never achieve. So you already feel lesser than when you step on the stage. You already know that you can't achieve the desired goal, which is beautiful, because then you get to go, well, I'm gonna do my best, and what happens, happens. I'm gonna prepare myself for perfection, and then I'm gonna jump off the cliff and see what happens. That's why I always talk about process with singers. It's like, you gotta give over to that, because the minute you're holding on to perfection and trying, to, you're, there's a grip, nothing's going to arrive. You've mm. got to free yourself. The thing that usually leads people to be a musician in particular is that they love making music and they want to share it with the world. And we come through an industry because we're trying to get perfection where it's like, no, not that, not that, nope, not that, don't do that, don't, no. And all of a sudden we go, okay, I won't do that. I won't, oh, no, okay, no, no. Uh, and all of a sudden we're trying to phonate through all this, don't do that, be careful, not too much, more of that, not enough. Constant scrutiny, which of course we need because we need that to get better. But then we're gonna stand up here with all of our shortcomings, trying to create vocal perfection and as a bonus, which is the real goal, to illuminate the human spirit. <laughs> Through masterpieces, it's like giving somebody the Mona Lisa going, here, repaint this in real time, and don't get it wrong, but make it your own, and make us see it anew. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So it's, it's insane what we try to do, and it's glorious at the same time. And so I try to go back to give them permission to reignite with that kid that's in front of the bathroom mirror going, or whatever they sing, um, to keep them focused through discipline of, okay, but you got to make sure you sing in tune and know that word isn't clear. Mm -hmm. So there's a discipline to what we do, but that's never... That's never my goal. It needs to be in place. But I want them to get that light bulb in their heart to just go, boom, oh, I remember why I do this. And it's okay that it arrives in whatever form it is. I'll go home and I'll work on these other things. I'll improve, I'll get better. But I want them to have the freedom because that is what I want to see on the stage. And I think it's what the world needs is somebody to demonstrate their heart going, I know I'm not perfect, but I want to share this with you. And listen to this Mozart. And then we meet Mozart anew through this voice in a space that's open and not rigid. So that's what I want. I think we're about to have light bulbs go off in all of our hearts. Um, Don't mess it up. <laughs> oh,
is a wonderful example of what of this how the past needs to be fed with the blood of the living. The entire canon has new meaning when it's when it's sung in any given moment. You singing Mahler and Sing Sing is different than you singing Mahler at um, at, uh, t at yesterday's uh, hall. So mm. you know, it's, it's um, we have some generous time for questions. And if I were David Lang, I would have said to you earlier, be thinking of questions. <laughs> I'm not David Lang. Um, <laughs> but I hope you were thinking of questions. Please. Thanks, this is so wonderful. Um, I w you mentioned improvisation. And uh, I've always wondered about the lack of emphasis on improvisation and composition in how we teach classical music today, as opposed to other music directions. And uh, yeah, I was wondering what you think, whether there should be more emphasis, whether we, even if we're professional performers, should be amateur composers and trying to come up with our own things, even if it's just for even more appreciation like masterworks, so that, yeah, we're able to see how difficult it is. I love that idea. Did you all, he was asking about improvisation. Um, I, it puts, <laughs> puts me in a deep fear state when you say we should all try composition because I can't do that. <laughs> but I do think what I think is, I think yes, to answer your question, it would be incredibly valuable whether we are inclined to composition or not. You, anytime you try to do something, you have a lot more respect for how complicated it is. I think in particular for singers, um, the ultimate goal for me is the sensation when I sing that even if it's 250 years old or ombra mai fu, that the sensation is that I'm creating it on the spot. Every note, every word, that my character that doesn't know what's coming next, mm -hmm. doesn't know that the count is gonna arrive and I have to go behind the chair, doesn't know that Susanna is going to push Carabino in to sing a song that he wrote. It has to be created on the spot, except it takes years of work to get it to the, but when we <laughs> arrive in the performance, it has to have spontaneity. And if we have played around with improvisation, that's amazing. I sing a lot of Handel where they used to improvise ornaments all the time. That would always be my goal, but I was always afraid that it wouldn't turn out right in the performance. So I would improvise and I would play around with ornaments on my own, in the privacy of my own home where nobody else was listening, and I would choose the ones I really like. Um, so it wasn't pure improvisation. But I would also say for singers too, physical improvisation is very important as well, because do you see how stuck we get in a position, in a singing position. And I think physical improvisation of what is our body actually, our body is our instrument. This is every cell of ourselves is creating the sound. And so we also, I think we could spend a lot more time physically on how we're presenting things as well. Freedom, all of that in the pursuit of, of musical and performing freedom. And I should add, if there are questions for our performers, please don't hesitate. Um, yes? I have a question for you both. Uh, both of I think a mic is coming to you. Yeah. Project, project. <laughs> no, <don't. laughs> <Sorry. Bravo>. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. My name is Sarah, and I study over at Princeton. And I'm a vocalist, and I'm wondering about if you've ever experienced a scenario on stage where you get an eyelash in your eye, or you suddenly get really <laughs> nauseous, or something physical that is just really bad, and you're just on stage, and you have to be on stage for like another 20 minutes. How do you handle that? <laughs> uh, the weird thing is, it's a great question. The weird thing is, are things like sneezing, or usually don't happen. Sometimes you can get dry. Um, but what has happened to me more often than, <laughs> thank you, is I will get the giggles and I can't recuperate. I was on stage for, in San Francisco with Thomas Hampson as Figaro and Matthew Polanzani 
as uh, Alma Viva. I was singing Rosina, and we were doing the trio. piano, piano. And I, well, now you're all going to know way more than you want to know about me. Tsiti, <laughs> tsiti is a lot of consonants to get out. And on my first tsiti, tsiti, a gigantic spitball landed right on Matthew Polentani's cheek. <laughs> and he went, poop! <laughs> and I went, <laughs> and Thomas Hampson went, <laughs> and Matthew Polentani went, poop! <laughs> and the whole trio was the three of us holding onto the balcony like this, not singing a word. So, that tends to happen to me more than something physical. <laughs> I did fall and break my leg on stage one time, but that's another story, yeah. I fell and broke my leg on stage, also in the Barber of Seville. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize it was broken. It happened at the start of the shows. It was in London, opening night, big cast. And um, uh, yeah, so I continued, and it hurt. But you know, I'm from the Midwest, the show must go on. And I didn't know it was broken. And um, uh, I went to the hospital afterwards and uh, I finished with a cane. And the doctor said, it is broken. Whatever you do, don't put weight on your foot. Okay, I won't now. Uh, and I finished the run in a wheelchair <laughs> with a bright pink cast because it matched my costume. So yeah. Please. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you picked the first piece and the last piece, and then um, you know all the other pieces were from different time periods, different composers, but did you have a general storyline or idea of where the piece was going as you were performing it? I had a vague wish that I wanted to get from point A to Z. I wanted to get from Ives to Mahler. <laughs> because for me, the Mahler was the destination, is the destination. Um, it's Ich bin der Welt abandon gekommen, which I think can mean a lot of different things. I think it's a very personal piece when you encounter it, and I fully anticipate it will change. My connection to it will change over time. But the way I see it now is um, where Eden lies, because, well, a lot to talk about, but where Eden lies for me, this idea of peace and rest, connection, real connection to the world around me, to the people I meet, and to myself. We wait for a long time to connect that final arc in Eden. <clears throat> and when it finally happens, it's the realization that the things that the world are telling me I need and is important is not where it lies. It's not where true connection lies. It's not where my happiness lies. It's not where I want to abide. I don't think it's about the afterlife necessarily. I think it's about right now. How do I stay present where I am with love in my heaven, my song? So I knew I wanted to get there. Um, we in a nutshell, the questions are asked. The first time I'm on Eden, the disc, the Lindenbaum comes mm -hmm. of Mahler. Ah, this is what it feels like. And then the rhythm of the earth in the Con le Stelle comes. And it's like, oh, right, I like this power. I like taking dominion over. Yes, I like, OK, this feels good. And you start to forget the nature is just going, oh, you're just borrowing this. So it becomes quite earthy. And then all of a sudden, angel of God appears and says, I'm going to destroy your seashores. This was written in Mozart's time. <laughs> and uh, spread a plague among you because you've forgotten where you come from. So it's a bit of a warning. Then we have a reset with the Copeland. And this is maybe my favorite moment of the piece because this started as me wanting to talk about the climate, knowing that nature has been such a, a muse for so many uh, composers, artists. 
And the headlines today and the work that we're doing, I mean, you're leading the way here in Princeton for sure, and the urgency and the fear that so many of us are feeling about it, I don't want us to forget about what is here, about the abundance that is here. And I think that is a really powerful way to also combat climate change. You know, it's like, hold on a second. Look what this forest is giving us. Look what the clean water is doing for us. And nature, the gentlest mother, is this reminder of she still has our back. I'm not sure we deserve it, but she still has our back. Even though we are wayward and we're not deserving, she's there giving us sunlight. But from that, you also then, we go into the Kavali and we see the landscape, the brokenness, which also disconnect madness into the gluck. When you're left with nothing, you're broken, you say, I need help. I need to find my way, which is the rosy steps. And you get back on the path. You see things in a new light. You say, ah, I don't need all this. And we're at the Mahler. It's kind of how I went. But it's, ich bin gestorben. I, I am dead. But what's, hmm, what's the I? To the dead. tumult of the world. I am dead to the tumult of yeah, the world. But yeah. who is the I? Yeah. That's what I was asking myself in your yeah. performance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who is the I? That's another discussion. But it is, it is, I'm dead to the world, but like my needs, my ego, myself, this, all this stuff I thought was so important. This isn't where I function. I function in the music and the song and connection and love and dialogue, not in the ooze of the world. Yeah. This is a, <clears throat> this is a follow up question to the last one, but with a bit of a twist. I was mesmerized by your performance last night at Richardson Auditorium, and I was thinking to myself, what does she actually think as she goes through this 90 minute, you're on stage apart from the orchestra by yourself, going from Cavalli to Mahler, Chard what are you thinking about all the time? And then I had another thought, because a couple of years before that, you were on the same stage by yourself singing Winterreise, totally stationary with Yannick at the piano. And so do you have to reinvent yourself every time for differences in that sort of repertoire? That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you really want to know what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you do. That's why you asked the question. Um, it's mm. a wild interior ride inside at least my head, maybe, I assume, in most singers. When I'm really in the groove, I'm really not thinking. Um, I'm in it. And there's a part of me that feels like it is taking me. And I can get to that point when I've done all the work. And I can trust that I'm ready. Uh, however, this production in particular, Eden, is very personal. Um, it is really ambitious. Uh, it doesn't look like anything else. And I have occasionally, it happened last night, uh, an interior battle of what are you doing? Who do you think you are? They're not getting this. Um, how dare you pretend to put all of this stuff out there? And it is, it, I mean, it sounds exaggerated, but it, becomes a little bit of battle of dark and light. And I'm literally in the spotlight. And my name is on the poster <laughs> and, you know, tickets have been sold. And it, so then the process becomes, well, it doesn't matter. You're here. So shut up and sing. <laughs> <laughs> and go back to that place where you know it works. And which also is kind of the same answer about do I have to reinvent myself? 
Um, it's why it's such a frightening path, but a glorious path of being a singer, if you really go there. Because the only place it really functions is when you are entirely present. And you're not worried about the high note coming up, or you're not regretting or beating yourself over for the thing that didn't work well. You are entirely in service of that note, that syllable, that message, that emotion, and you have to get out of your way so that it arrives to the audience. But it is, it, it is sometimes a very frightening moment because there's nowhere to hide. And I love it. <laughs> and I, it's terrifying at times, and there, you know, imposter syndrome, we hear a lot about it. It's real, in my case it's real. It's not present all the time. Um, and then the kids come on stage, and I'm like, oh, right, see, Joyce, it's not about you. And, it's, and it's, um, <coughs> it puts me back in that place of service. The other thing I tell singers, the sooner you can make it not about you, the better. You remember it's a service industry. Um, the problem is it has to be about you because you've got to get perfect <laughs> and keep all of this in a good place and rested, and you have to be take care of yourself and keep attention on yourself. But when the light comes on, the piano starts, it has to be about something bigger. Please. for me, um, but I want to ask about the other musician on stage, the accompanist. Uh, what do you look for in a good accompanist? And if, if you were talking to both, each, each of the singers one at a time, and their accompanist, how would you like the coloration or performance of the accompanist to change? It's, it's so similar to what I want from the, the singers or what I look for from myself. Um, it has to have a sense of being improvised. And I think the best um, collaborators are the ones that are listening and inspiring and responding like a great tennis match. Federer and Nadal, man. You want them both like mm, challenging each other and inspiring each other. The other thing is, because a lot of times the collaboration involves coaching and you're exploring this music together, I look for the same thing from a stage director and a conductor, I want my collaborators to help me find things I can't find on my own. Had, have you heard this? But listen to what this diminished chord is doing. And I feel like you're not leaning into that. Oh, right. I will often say to my pianist too, it's like, can you mm, interrupt me here or delay that thing? And it's trying to find a, a common sculpting pattern. If the singer is painting and the pianist is painting together, we're sculpting something. And it has to have that same feeling of improvisation. Yeah. This is such a beautiful question because for us, how to collaborate is always a difficult question in all of our fields. And musicians uh, perform in every collaboration a kind of mutual permeability, a mm. permeability to each other so that they can transfigure each other. Schoenberg's Tekletana, uh, Transfigured yeah. Night. That that the persons are, are walking next to each other, but they're changing each other's insides as they perform. And yeah. we have a lot to learn from that. So this exchange was wonderful. Yeah. Other questions, please. Hi, my name is Jenna, um, and I'm a young soprano. And my question is, when you were just starting out in your career, um, how did you face all of the rejections that come with being a young artist, especially when singing and artistry is so personal and so connected to who we are as humans. Don't take it personally. Welcome the feedback. You have to become very savvy about the feedback that is genuine and clear and helpful and filter out anything that feels like there's an, a, an agenda at play. Um, don't assume there's an agenda, but if there is, say thank you, move on. This feedback I got in that competition, I was 29. I was 29 when that person said, you have nothing to offer as an artist. I cried, then I was angry. Who does he think he is, right? 
well, he's quite an established person. After a few months, it took me months, but I thought, I don't think he's, you know, an evil person. What prompted him to say that to me? I was prepared. I'm singing well. I know what I'm doing. Why would he say that? And I kept inquiring, and it took me a long time to find the answer. And I finally realized he was a thousand percent right because I walked onto that stage and I was perfectly polished and I was regurgitating everything I had been told to do. And I was generic and I was correct and I was empty. I wasn't saying anything. And it's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me because I said, I'll be damned if that anybody ever can say that to me again. They may not like what, they, what I say, but they're gonna know that I am committed to this. And it was a wake up call. And now I'm, I'm wildly uh, <laughs> intolerant of people that come up to something sacred, like a stage where people have paid money, where you're singing things that are pff, masterpieces and you come and you don't commit. I don't have any tolerance for that anymore. And so filter, don't take it personally because every bit of good feedback you get, good advice, good steering will make you a better artist if you can learn how to interpret it to serve your goals, okay? It's rough. I don't know if it's this way in your thing, but basically you go to university because you want to sing and all you hear is what is wrong and what isn't working. And that's how you get better. And you'll find the right people that can still encourage you. I think positive feedback is really helpful but don't shy away from the criticism. It's gonna, if you internalize it, digest it, don't take it personally. It's not against your being. You just have more work to do. I think that's another thing that binds our modes of life uh, at the Institute and on the opera, and that is um, relentless critique. Yeah. Uh, never ending, at no point in one's uh, thought or life or performance does it end. And so, so how do you deal with it? Um, <laughs> I take it so personally. You do? <laughs> well, stop uh, it! <laughs> no, I know. And now I'm afraid to breathe. No. <laughs> we have just um, witnessed an extraordinary uh, array of critique, of belligerent optimism, of permeability and openness to mutual uh, um, uh, work. It's really been, I, I'm sure, a thousand, well, there's not a thousand seats here, but light bulbs did burst in all of your hearts. I want to ask you to return March 23rd when Daniel Weiss, the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, joins us to talk about museums, what they're for and what their future is. But first, long before March 23rd, I want to thank you all and Joyce, for being here. Thank you. You're welcome, David. Thank you.